So we are on chapter four. <clears throat> so previously on Howl's Moving Castle, Sophie had been working at her father's hat shop um, under her stepmother's name. No, not stepmother's name. Under her stepmother's, um, her stepmother's rule. We're going to call it that. We're going to pretend that she's ruling over her. Um, and Sophie was is a hat maker. Um, she usually tries to stay away from customers. She's kind of shy and um, likes to keep to herself. Um, and one day, the Witch of the Waste went into her family's hat shop and they turned her into a old lady. She turned, the Witch of the Waste turned her into an old lady. Um, also, some side details, I don't know if they're going to matter for this um, particular chapter, but Letty, who had went to, um, had went to the bakery, to work at the bakery called Cesari's, um, actually isn't Letty. It is her other sister, Martha. So, in the movie, they, I don't think they mentioned that in the movie, um, but yeah, Martha is the one who is in the bakery, um, and she's pretending to be Letty, while Letty is off living with the witch. Um, not the Witch of the Waste, but um, Mrs. Fairfax, I think her name was. Um, and she's the good witch. So, yeah. Um, and then uh, also in Chapter 3, um, we have found that Sophie has constructed a deal with the demon Calcifer. Um, and he is going to try and break her curse. And, he, and she's supposed to try and break his contract with Hal. So, we've only met Calcifer and um, Michael so far. So, let's see if we're finally going to meet Hal in Chapter 4. Chapter 4, in which Sophie discovers several strange things. When Sophie woke up, daylight was streaming across her. Since Sophie remembered no windows at all in the castle, her first notion was that she had fallen asleep trimming hats and dreamed of leaving home. The fire in front of her had sunk to a rosy charcoal and white ash, Okay, which convinced her that she had certainly dreamed there was a fire demon. But her very first movements told her that there were some things that she had not dreamed. There were sharp cracks from all over her body. Ow! She exclaimed. I ache all over. The voice that exclaimed was a weak, cracked pipping. She put her knobby hands to her face and felt the wrinkles. At that, she discovered she had been in a state of shock all yesterday. She was very angry indeed with the Witch of the Waste for doing this to her, hugely, enormously angry. Sailing into shops and churning people old, she exclaimed, Oh, what I won't do to her! Her anger made her jump up in so, so salvo, salvo, <laughs> all right, of cracks and creaks and hobble over to the unexpected window. It was above the workbench to her utter astonishment. The view from it was a view of a dock town, dockside town. She could see a sloping, unpaved street lined with small, rather poor-looking houses and masts sticking up from beyond the roofs. Beyond the masts, she caught a glimmer of the sea, which was something she had never seen in her life before. "'Wherever am I?' Sophie asked the skull standing on the bench. Although I don't think it was really standing. Wouldn't it be have been sitting on the bench? <laughs> Do, 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 do. I don't expect you to answer that, my friend, she added hastily, remembering that this was the wizard's castle, and she turned round to take a look at the room. It was quite a small room with heavy black beam beams in the ceiling. By daylight, it was amazingly dirty. The stones of the floor were stained with greasy ash, 
was piled within the fender and cobwebs hung in dusty droops from the beams. There was a layer of dust on the skull. Sophie absently wiped it off as she went to peer into the sink beside the workbench. She shuddered at the pink and gray slime in it and the white slime dripping from the pump above. Hal obviously did not care did not care what squalor his se- servant lived in. The rest of the castle had to be beyond one of the other of the four low black doors around the room. Sophie opened the nearest in the end wall behind the bench. There was a large bathroom beyond it. It was some ways it was a bathroom you might normally find in a place in a palace full of luxuries such as an indoor toilet, a shower stall, and immense bath with clawed feet. The mirrors of every and mirrors on every wall. But it was even dirtier than the other room. Sophie winced from the toilet flinched at the color of the bath recoiled from the green weed growing in the shower and quite easily avoided looking at her shriveled shape in the mirrors because the glass was plastered with blobs and runnels of nameless substances. The nameless substances themselves were crowded into a very large shelf over the bath. They were in jars, boxes, tubes, and hundreds of tattered brown packets and paper bags. The biggest jar had a name. It was called drying powder in crooked letters. Sophie was not sure whether there should be a D in that or not. Oh, drying power, not powder. It was drying power. She picked up the packet at random, picked up a packet at random. It had skin scrawled on it and she put it back hurriedly. Another jar said eyes in the same scrawl. A tube stated for decay. Oh God. It seemed to work too, Sophie murmured, looking to the wash bin with a shiver. Water ran into the basin when she turned a blue-green knob that might have been brass and washed some of the decay away. Sophie rinsed her hands and face in the water without touching the basin, but she did not have the courage to use the drying power. She dried the water with her skirt and then set off to the next black door. That one opened into a flight of rickety, rickety wooden stairs. Sophie heard someone move up there and shut the door hurriedly. It seemed only to lead to a sort of loft anyways. She hobbled to the next door. By now, she was moving quite easily. She was a hailed old woman, and she discovered that yesterday. The third door opened onto a pokey backyard with, a high, br- with high brick walls. It contained a big stack of logs and hidgely pidgely heaps of what seemed to be scrap iron, wheels, buckets, metal she- sheeting, wire mounted almost to the tops of his walls, of the walls. Dang, I can't read. <laughs> Sophie shut the door too, rather puzzled because it did not seem to match the castle at all. There was no castle to be seen above the brick walls. They even ended at the sky. Sophie could only think that this is part of was. Oh my god! Sophie could only think that this part was round the side where the visible wall had stopped invisible wall had stopped her the night before she opened the fourth door and it was just a broom cupboard with two fine but dusty velvet cloaks hanging on the brooms sophie shut it again slowly the only other door was in the wall with the window and that door she had come in by 
Last night, she hobbled, I mean, had come in by last night. She hobbled over and cautiously opened that. She stood for a moment looking out at a slowly moving view of the hills, watching Heather slide past underneath the door, feeling the wind blow her wispy hair and listening to the rumble and grinding of the big black stones as the castle moved. Then she shut the door and went to the window and there was the seaport town again. It, it was no picture. A woman had opened a door opposite and was sweeping dust into the street. Behind that house was a grayish canvas sail was going up a mast in brisk jerks, it dis disturbing a flock of seagulls into flying round and round against the glimmering sea. I don't understand, Sophie told the human skull. Then, because the fire looked almost out, she went and put a couple of logs in and raked away some ash. Green flames cl climbed between the logs, small and curly, and shot up into a long face with flaming green hair. Good morning, said the fire demon. Don't forget that we have a bargain. So none of it was a dream. Sophie was not much given to crying, but she sat in the chair for quite a while staring at a blurred and sliding fire demon and did not pay attention to the sounds of Michael getting up until she found him standing beside her looking embarrassed and a little exasperated. You're still here, he said. Is something the matter? Sophie sniffed. I'm old, she began. But it was just as the witch had said and the fire demon had guessed. Michael said cheerfully. Well, it comes to us all in time. Would you like some breakfast? Sophie discovered that she was a very hale old woman indeed. After only bread and cheese at lunchtime yesterday, she was ravenous. She means she was starving. <laughs> yes, she said, and Michael went to the closest to the closet in the wall. She had sprang up and peered over his shoulder to see that there what there was to eat. I'm afraid there's only bread and cheese, Michael said rather stiffly. But there's a whole basket of eggs in there, Sophie said. And isn't that bacon? What about a hot drink as well? Where's your kettle? There isn't one, Michael said. How's the only one who can cook? I can cook, said Sophie. Unhook, unhook that frying pan and I'll show you. She reached for the large black pan hanging on the closet wall in spite of Michael trying to prevent her. You don't understand, Michael said. It's Calcifer, the fire demon. He won't bend his hand to be cooked on for anyone but how. Sophie turned and looked at the fire demon. He flickered back at her wickedly. I refuse to be exploited, he said. You mean, Sophie said to Michael, that you have to do without even a hot drink unless Hal's here? Michael gave an embarrassed nod. Then you're the one that's being exploited, said Sophie. Give that here. She wrenched the pan from Michael's resisting fingers. That was the word, sorry. Michael's resisting fingers plonked the bacon onto it and popped a handy wooden spoon into the egg basket and marched with the lot to the fireplace. Now, Calcifer, she said, let's have no more nonsense. Bend down your head. You can't make me, crackled the fire. Oh, yes, I can, Sophie crackled back with the ferocity that had often stopped both her sisters in mid-fight. You don't, if you don't, I shall pour water on you, or shall I pick up the tongs and take away both your logs? she added, as she got herself crookedly onto her knees by the hearth. There she, there she whispered, or 
I can go back on our bargain and tell Howl about it, can't I? Oh, curses! Calcifer spat. What did you let her in for, Michael? Sulkily, he bent his head face forward until all that could be seen of him was a ring of curly green flames dancing on the logs. Thank you, said Sophie, and slapped the heavy pan onto the green ring to make sure Calcifer did not suddenly rise up again. I hope your bacon burns, Calcifer said, muffled under the pan. Sophie slapped slices of bacon into the pan. It was good and hot. The bacon sizzled, and she had to wrap her skirt round her hand to hold the handle. The door opened, but she did not notice because of her because of the sizzling. Don't be silly, she told Calcifer, and hold still because I want to break the eggs. Oh, hello, Hal, Michael said helplessly. Sophie turned round at the rather her at that rather hurriedly. She stared. The tall young fellow in a flamboyant blue and silver suit who had just come in and stopped the act of leaning a guitar in the corner. He brushed the fair hair from his rather curious glass green eyes and stared back. His long, angular face was perplexed. Who on earth are you? said Hal. Where have I seen you before? I'm a total stranger, Sophie lied firmly. After all, Hal had only met her long enough to call her a mouse before. So it was almost true. She ought to have been thanking her stars for the lucky escape she had then. She supposed, but it but in fact her main thought was good gracious. Willard Hal is only a child in his twenties for all his wickedness. It made such a difference to be old, she thought, as she turned the bacon over in the pan. And she would have died rather than let this overdressed boy know that she was the girl he had pitied on May Day. Hearts and souls did not enter into it. Hal was not going to know. She says her name's Sophie, Michael said. She came last night. How did she make Calcifer bend down, said Hal. She bullied me, Calcifer said in a, pre in a pretentious muffled voice from under the sizzling pan. Not many people can do that, Hal said thoughtfully. He propped his guitar in the corner and came over to the hearth. The smell of... Oh my god, I cannot read this darn flower's name. Or whatever it is. Um, Hesithens mixed with the smell of bacon as he shoved Sophie firmly aside. Calcifer doesn't like anyone but me to cook on him. He said, kneeling down and wrapping one trailing sleeve round his head, hand to hold the pan. Pass me two more slices of bacon and six more eggs, please. And tell me why you've come here. Sophie stared at the blue jewel hanging from Hal's ear and passed him egg after egg. Why I came, young man? She said. It was obvious after what she had seen of the castle. I came here because I'm your new cleaning lady, of course. Are you indeed, Hal said, cracking the eggs one-handed and tossing the shells among the logs where Calcifer seemed to be eating them with a lot of snarling and, grob and gobbling. <laughs> Who says you are? I do, so said Sophie, and she added poisonously. Poise oh, gosh. I can clean the dirt from this place even if I can't clean you from your wickedness, young man. Hal's not wicked, Michael said. Yes, I am, Hal contradicted him. You forget just how wicked I'm being at the moment, Michael. <laughs> he jerked his chin at Sophie. If you're so anxious to, to be of use, my good woman, find some knives and forks and clear the bench. 
There were tall stools under the workbench. Michael was pulling them out to sit on and pushing aside all the things on top of it, which make room for some knives and forks he had taken from a drawer in the side of it. Sophie went to help him. She had not expected Hal to welcome her. Of course. But he had not even so far agreed to let her stay beyond breakfast. Since Michael did not seem to need help, Sophie shuffled over to her stick and put so, put it slowly and Oh, thank you for hosting. Thank you. <laughs> I lost my spot. So Sophie shuffled over to her stick and put it slowly and surely in the broom cupboard. When that did not seem to attract Hal's attention, she said, You can make me on for months. You can take me on for months for a month's trial if you like. Oh, gosh, that was way too difficult to read. <laughs> Wizard Hal said nothing, but plates, please, Michael, and stood up holding the smoking pan. Calcifer sprang up with a roar of relief and blazed high in the chimney. Sophie made another attempt to pin the wizard down. If I'm going to be cleaning here for the next month, she said, I'd like to know where the rest of the castle is. I can only find this one room and the bathroom. To her surprise, both Michael and the wizard howl and the wizard roared with laughter. Ha 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 ha! It was not until they almost finished breakfast that Sophie discovered that what had made them laugh. Hal was not only hard to pin down, he seemed to dislike answering any question at all. Sophie gave up asking him and asked Michael instead. Tell her, said Hal. It will stop her, <laughs> her pestering. There isn't any more of the castle, Michael said, except that you've what you've seen, the two bedrooms upstairs. Except for what you've seen and the two bedrooms upstairs. What? Sophie exclaimed. Hal and Michael laughed again. Hal and Calcifer invented the castle, Michael explained, and Calcifer keeps it going. The inside of it is really just Hal's old house in Port Haven, which is the only real part. But Port Haven's miles down near the sea, Sophie said. I call that too bad. What do you mean by having this great ugly castle rushing about the hills and frightening everyone in market shipping to death? Hal shrugged. What an outspoken old woman you are. I've reached the stage in my career where I need to impress everyone with my power and wickedness. I can't have the king thinking well of me. And last year, I offended someone very powerful, and I need to keep out of their way. It seemed a funny way to avoid someone, but Sophie supposed wizards had different standards from ordinary people, and she shortly discovered that the castle had other peculiar peculiar peculiarities. I can't say this word. I know what it is, but I can't read it. <laughs> They have finished eating, and Michael was piling the plates in the slimy sink beside the bench, where there came a loud howl knocking at the door. Ow, that hurt my knuckles doing that for you guys. I tried to make this more fun. <laughs> Casper blazed up. Kingsbury door! Howl, what, who was... On his way to the bathroom, went to the door instead. There was a square wooden knob above the door set to the lintel. With a dab of paint on each of its four sides. At the moment, there was a green blob on the side that was at the bottom. I can't read. But Hal turned the knob round and it had a red blob downward before he opened the door. Out 
outside stood a a personage wearing a stiff white wig and a wide hat on top of that. He was clothed in scarlet and purple and gold, and he held up a little staff decorated with ribbons like an infant maypole. He bowed, scents of cloves and orange blossoms blew in the room. His Majesty the King presents his compliments and sends payment for 2,000 pair of seven-leagued boots. This person said. Behind him, Sophie had glimpsed a coach. Oh. Behind him, Sophie had glimpsed a coach of waiting in a coach waiting in the street full of sumptuous houses covered with painted carvings and towers and spears. Ears and domes beyond that of a splendor she had barely before imagined. She was sorry it took so little time for the person at the door to hand over a long silken chinked purse. Chinked purse. Chinking purse. Gosh darn. Chinking purse and for Howl to take the purse, bow back, and shut the door. Howl turned the square knob back to the green blob was downward. Again, and stowed the long purse in his pocket. Sophie saw Michael's eyes follow the purse in an urgent, worried way. Hal went straight to the bed bathroom then, calling out, I need hot water in here, Calcifer, and was gone for a long, long time. Sophie could not restrain her curiosity, however. Whoever, however, whoever was that at the door, she asked Michael. Or do I mean wherever? That door gives on Kingsbury, Michael said, where the king lives. I think that man was the ch the, ch the chancellor's clerk. And he added worriedly to Calcifer, I don't wish he hadn't given Hal all that money. Is Hal going to let me stay here? Sophie asked. If he is... You'll never pin, pin him down, Michael answered. He hates being pinned down to anything. And that is the end of chapter four. So I hope you guys enjoyed chapter four. I think I might continue on to chapter five in just a moment. All right. So I know that in the movies, um, they instead of calling him Michael, they call him Markle. And I don't know, I don't know if this is because of it originally having been like, not the book being originally um, Japanese, but the fact that the actual studio was Japanese. Maybe they messed it up and translated Michael to Markle um, because it is an English name. And so, yes, it is actually the name Michael instead of Markle, like they say in the book. I mean, not book, like they say in the movie. So, yeah, I don't understand why the name sounds different in the movie, but it is indeed just regular plain Michael. So... Yeah.